For generations, men have lusted after her. The biggest, fastest, most dangerous game fish in the sea. Her dorsal fin rises like a warning. Her flanks flash, radiating excitement. And she wields a weapon, like some fabulous creature out of myth. A gigantic, slashing spear. For the chance to pit their skill against a billfish, some anglers pay thousands of dollars. But one man seeks something more, to encounter sword-wielding giants face to face. To meet these superfish on their terms in the open sea. The billfish swims in a world without walls or boundaries, a vast space in places thousands of feet deep. It's a highway for seekers on an endless journey, the open road connecting distant feeding grounds. Where fish seem to swim in the sky and birds to fly in the water, emptiness gives way to abundance. Driven by ever-shifting winds and currents, this banquet is a movable feast, never lasting very long. Few people can find it, let alone capture it on film. So for two decades, marine biologist and acclaimed cameraman Rick Rosenthal has set out to do the impossible. When we go looking for big fish, we try to go out in a wild area on the banks where there's a gathering place for food and there's strong currents and lots of life. If you're going to find anything, you've got to go out in that big blue out there to those secret hiding places, those refuges that hold a great deal of pelagic life. Pelagic life. These ocean wanderers inhabit an environment so alien to our own that it's easy to forget we share a planet. Yet these creatures are ancient and amazing, honed through the eons to a perfect balance of predator and prey. At the top of the pyramid are the billfish. They include the graceful sailfish, the fearsome swordfish, and queen of all, the marlin. Few bony fish grow bigger or swim faster. Propelled by a hyper-flexible backbone and a gigantic tail, she can fly through the water, topping speeds of 60 miles an hour, on migrations that can span 9,000 miles. Though their bills look like weapons, many scientists believe that the long overbite is primarily defensive, a vestige from prehistoric times when the ocean teemed with armed predatory fish. Just as a human face reveals emotion, the skin of a billfish telegraphs mood. The belly of an agitated white marlin shimmers in rainbow hues. The master of its environment, it hunts both far and deep. In cold, dark waters, a remarkable muscle generates heat for its eyes and brain. It keeps the marlin alert when other fish are sluggish, an important advantage in its incessant search for fuel. This blue marlin 
weighs in at 600 pounds, but some tip the scale at 1,000 pounds and more. Those are the prize fish, the ones known as granders. We covet them, but do we actually know them? Blinded by the trophy, we've never really seen this incomparable fish. The billfish seems to capture our imagination more than any other fish. Their life history is such a mystery because we can't go with them. We can't follow them. We don't see them along the shoreline very often, and that makes it very difficult for scientists and biologists to study them. You read the books, pick up the magazines, you talk to the scientists, they're still scratching their head. They know very little. And yet, the romance with the fish has a long and venerable history. A giant marlin is, after all, the same fish celebrated by Ernest Hemingway in The Old Man and the Sea. The classic story of a solitary man facing off against the force of nature is one that resonates with the biologist. As a boy, I read Hemingway, and I read everything I could about the ocean, the outdoors, and I thought, what would it be like to see a fish the size that Hemingway described in that book? Or, you know, even better, what would it be like to swim with one of those? As Rick begins his journey into the world of billfish off Mexico's Baja Peninsula, he plans to bring back a different kind of trophy, images of the living fish. Here, the California current acts like a powerful conveyor belt, sweeping along great schools of baitfish, prime prey for oceanic hunters. To be here and see these dolphins on the run, chasing fish, and the tuna exploding out of the water, sometimes eight, ten feet in the air, you're right in the Marlin food patch. You found the show. Bright blue fins herald the arrival of striped marlin. Striped marlin aren't really schooling fish, but they're tuned to the same things, so they stay in close proximity to each other. When they come upon a scene like this, they close ranks and force the bait fish together. Is this cooperative feeding? I don't know, but it's one heck of a food fight. For Rick, there's a dangerously fine line between getting close to the action and becoming part of it. Those small bait fish see you and they swarm around you for protection, to get away from the predators. And it's pretty unnerving. I can't see anymore. It's dark in there. It's lights out. Alerted by the commotion, a small herd of sea lions arrive and begin to gorge themselves. It's a rare scene. Sea lions seldom mix with marlin. They only meet in the California current today because both animals will travel extraordinary distances to follow the food. I'm holding my breath. I'm not using scuba gear because the bubbles frighten the animals. Within minutes, there's nothing but a glittering rain of fish scales. Predators take off in search of new hunting grounds with Rick close behind. But right in the middle of their aquatic superhighway, they run into a wall, a massive net. Inside that big tuna net, it was just panic. 
the tuna, the dolphins, and to my surprise, there were big marlin and sailfish trapped inside there as well. And that's the first time I felt like an oceanic animal that was totally panicked. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The experience will haunt Rick for months to come and gives his mission a new sense of urgency. He's not the only one hunting billfish. Ironically, his competitors are also the best source of information for locating his prey. Their rumors lead him east, where the pincers of the western tip of Cuba and the jutting Yucatan Peninsula create the Caribbean basin. Here, sportsmen whisper about a fantastic but elusive annual event, a huge host of migrating sailfish. No one knows why it's only recently come to light. Perhaps oceanic conditions have changed, or it could be a measure of how well the sea keeps its secrets. They're here to get this big sailfish extravaganza. I'm glad to see all those birds. They're like thousands of spotter planes helping me to find the fish. There's far more frigate birds here than most places we'll ever see in the world. In fact, this is the largest gathering of frigate birds in the whole Caribbean right now during the nesting season. And they eat a lot of fish. They require a lot of protein. And for them to be here and roost and nest and feed their young day after day after day, there has to be a lot of food out there. And that food, the sardines, it's the same food that the sailfish, the marlin, the tuna are eating as well. For the next several weeks, when the birds take off at first light, they have company. There are no better guides for the billfish chasing filmmaker. Even though we have all this modern technology, radar and GPS and depth sounders, we still rely on some of those old telltale signs like seabirds hovering overhead, a distant dolphin blow, a splash, to take us to the action. At other times, we look for converging currents, and we see those from coloration changes in the water. Or maybe you almost see waves on one side of a current line, and the other, it'll be smooth water. You can almost hear what we call the sea wind. And when we find those convergent lines, those are highways that take us to activity. And that's just learned through years of, of working in the open ocean and having a lot of patience as well. Rick's faith in the birds finally pays off. They hover over another seafarer's signpost, sargassum weed trapped between converging currents. Rick dives into a world bisected by color, blue on one side, green on the other. He picks up new guides to point his way, a fleet of mobular rays. I can feel the temperature difference. One side of my body is warm and the other side is cold. This must be what a fish feels. The rays, they swim in and out of that current line. They seem to know exactly where that temperature difference is. Rick spies a school of sardines on the run. Hot on their tail, a sailfish. With growing excitement, Rick pursues it into the warm blue water. It could be his ticket to one of nature's most dramatic events, if the stories are true. reality exceeds rumor you're pumped up it's the great brush the sailfish is the dancer of billfish its turns are quick and elegant all grace and control the bird-like pelvic fins allow it to tread water so it can stay in one place as it feeds it dazzles most when on the attack. Unfurling its magnificent sail, it flushes from silver to black. A visceral response or a deliberate act?
This is a real special moment. There's more sailfish in a group than I've seen anywhere in the world. When sailfish get excited, their skin shows it, but the sail is what really sets them apart. It makes them look twice their size. They seem to use it like a matador's cape to confuse and herd their prey. They come for the sudden concentration of prey, corralled by moon and tides into the compressed shallows of the Caribbean. Now that their secret is out, Rick fears for their future. Fishermen are bound to exploit the event, as they have elsewhere. One tragic example, the fertile waters where the biggest billfish ever were caught. Along the coast of Peru, the Antarctic waters of the Humboldt Current meet warm equatorial currents. Their collision creates a biological hotspot. The harsh desert landscape stands in stark contrast to the rich diversity of life just offshore. Here, a steady wind stirs up a phenomenal crop of plankton. Tons of baitfish course after them, and in their wake, even big fish like sailfish, marlin, and swordfish rise to the surface and into the waiting nets and harpoons of an army of fishermen. The heart of the fishery is Cabo Blanco, a small village that looms large in angling lore. Once the fishing grounds just off its shore were known as Marlin Boulevard. In the 1950s, Cabo Blanco's reputation as a grander gold mine attracted sportsmen and celebrities alike. Hemingway stayed for a month. But no one landed more of the thousand pound fish known as granders than Texas oilman Alfred Cassell. He brought his boat to the Miss Texas all the way down from Nova Scotia, where she was custom built. Good Lord, there's no end to him. on tearing up the ocean. At 1,560 pounds, it was the biggest game fish ever taken by rod and reel. Macho swagger dictated that Glassell refer to the record winner as a male. But all marlin topping 400 pounds are actually female. Nature's way of assuring only the largest individuals bear the next generation. It could be argued that the human record holder is female as well. By some accounts, Kimberly Wiss caught the biggest fish. Unfortunately, when it was tipped upside down on the scale, 150 pounds of squid slid out of its mouth, and the record slipped through Kimberly's fingers. Glassell and his friends reeled in so many big fish that they lined the path to their exclusive club with marlin tails. Sixty years later, the sport fishing has dried up. Only memories of the glory days remain. I have mixed emotions when I walked to the old clubhouse. I would have loved to have been there, that time when it was real excitement, knowing that there was big fish out there swimming, even close to the beach, that the ocean was probably boundless, that there was lots of food. On the other hand, what we know today is that those giants may be just ghosts. Rick thinks one of the reasons the Granders have deserted Cabo Blanco is the ever-increasing pressure on the squid fishery. Squid fishing is a tough job. Out all night in every kind of weather, the fishermen endure conditions as brutal as their lures. Alien, yet elegant creatures locals call red devils glide through the current. The reason becomes clear once they're caught. 
It's a man-sized cannibal with a vicious beak. This is really a wild fishery out here. Here comes a squid. It's holding on to a lure, a jig. Look at him jet like a big fire hose. What impressive animal. But everything is eating these squids. The whales, the big fish, and the big black marlin. The world record marlin they caught here years ago, they were eating these squids. Really an important resource. Maybe one reason that the marlin are disappearing. Rick's desire to swim with squid shocks the fishermen. They place bets on whether he'll make it back out in one piece. Rick keeps a sharp eye out for nocturnal hunters, which are attracted to the fisherman flights. He hopes for a swordfish. Instead, he's confronted by a hungry sea lion. Squid make easy prey, especially for other squid. Frantic, the victim spews a jet of ink. Poor defense against a deadly stranglehold. Even cannibalized squid get tossed in the hold. The fishermen will take every ounce to reach their goal. Six tons of red devils before morning. Dawn on the docks reveals how much devastation just one night can bring. There are hundreds of small craft, each carrying tons of squid. The fishermen make pennies on the pound, a pitiful return, and yet the most productive fishery. The Humboldt current yields nearly one-fifth of the ocean's total catch. That includes the daily mountain of anchovies, the anchor fish that supports the entire ecosystem. It's sold to make fish meal for livestock feed and fertilizer. Cheap protein for our pigs and gardens, and it comes at a terrible price to the ocean community. What's left for the billfish? The story is the same up and down the coast, in all the seaports that line the Humboldt current. A relentless harvest driven by poverty and greed. Billfish after billfish, marlin and sailfish, swordfish, dorado, mahi-mahi, wahoo, sharks, the whole pelagic system, boat after boat unloading on this beach, to be taken away by truck and put on the plane and most of it going to the United States. Buyer, beware. A century of industrial pollution has contaminated the entire marine food chain. Mercury in toxic levels concentrates in top predators like marlin, tuna, and swordfish. Except in small quantities, this fish is unsafe, yet we keep eating more of it to the detriment of all. When you see a scene like this, you really get the idea of how this can't continue, why there's such a shortage of fish in the ocean. The man is just so insatiable. This is why we're in trouble. We can't keep harvesting the sea this way. The carcass of a mighty fish marks the passing of a once great fishery.
these marlin populations won't recover if we keep taking the big egg-bearing females. We've lost more than 90% of the billfish in just the last 50 years. Sickened by the slaughter, Rick moves on hoping there's a better way. In South Florida, the culture of the sportsman runs deep. But in recent years, it seemed easier to find big fish on the walls than in the water. Commercially valuable broadbill swordfish have been hit especially hard. Now, a moratorium on long lines is bringing back this most aggressive of billfish. So this bill came off of a 400-pound swordfish. Swimming at 50 miles an hour, that's one powerful animal. If you have to attack something, this is what you want to have on the end of your nose, your upper jaw. One big bill that can cut through the water or run another predator through. But these fish will take on anything and they're really unpredictable. They've been known to skewer big sea turtles and even mako sharks that attack them. They've found bills broken off in their spine. Even the research submarine Alvin was attacked by a swordfish. At depth, it penetrated the hull of the boat. The sub had to surface in real danger. And when it came up, the swordfish was still attached and the crew ate the swordfish later. So I'm gonna to try to swim with one of these critters at night, and it's sporting one of these bills, this weapon. It's gonna be an exciting evening. We better go then, huh? All right, let's All go. Right. Let's Rick going. joins researchers who are gathering data for the National Marine Fisheries Service. The team's guide is commercial sword fisherman, Tim Palmer. He has a unique gift of finding these deep dwelling secretive fish and keeping hooked ones healthy. Tonight, the research team will fit swordfish with satellite tags, part of their effort to restore swordfish populations. The tools of their trade, the holding device known as a snooter, baited lines and pop-off satellite tags. Over three months, these tags will record temperatures, light levels and diving depths every 10 seconds, then pop off for collection. After three hours, the team pulls in the lines. It's exhausting work because whatever's on the other end resists with all its might. Nearly 12 feet long and more than 450 pounds, it's the largest swordfish ever brought in for attacking. Which makes it tough to wrangle. The tag is in. Now, if only Rick can be as successful getting his shot. I'm in the dark water by myself with just a camera, and you wonder if the guys on the surface that are trying to tag the fish really have a hold of it. Can they hang on to this fish if it gains strength and energy? That's really a tricky situation. The crew runs water over the fish's gills, building up its oxygen so it will be in good shape for release. These fish are so unpredictable. You let your guard down and you get slammed. If I had been swimming and filming between the fish and the boat, as I often do, it would have busted me up. As soon as the snooter is removed, the broadbill swordfish swims away. It heads back down into the Gulf Stream. While Rick travels a thousand miles west to Costa Rica's Pacific coast. Years ago, he spotted something in these strong currents and sheltering reefs that few have seen before in the deep water close to the shore. A baby sailfish. Now, he's come back to capture one on camera. He waits for night when the plankton rises. Way, huh? 
What do you think? Yep. Depth is looking good for what we want to do tonight. Yeah, I think so. That base is slowly rising up. Hopefully it'll come up and give us a show. Look at that water temperature. 87 degrees. Yeah, you think you need a little thicker wetsuit? I don't think I need any, but I don't like to be stung. <laughs> the boat drifts in the current till it melts into the scenery. Its light is brighter than the moon's and draws countless tiny animals into its sphere. But a billfish hatchling, the odds weigh heavily against it. And yet... We have squid now. Squid are in the lights right now. So just let that bite work and see who comes up. snow, the larvae of other fish, and baby squid all abound, but still no billfish. Rick swims through a shadow land thousands of feet deep. Out of the dark, animals can materialize not just from in front or behind, but above or below as well. We're down swimming around in that dark sea, looking in a miniature world, and suddenly I feel a whoosh underneath my armpit, and I think it's my dive partner. And I look towards him, and, and he points towards the surface, and there's an adult sailfish swimming right over our head feeding. That was the last thing I was expecting. Unlike swordfish and marlin, sailfish don't see well in the dark. Until this image, the first of its kind, few suspected an adult sailfish would even feed at night. They're far more versatile than we ever thought. This fish is taking advantage of the underwater light. It's a kind of behavior we can only learn by getting into the water and spending a great deal of time in their world. Then a miracle in miniature appears. Tiny, but not defenseless, a baby sailfish has razor-sharp teeth, which it loses only as it grows larger. Its sleek body makes it a formidable hunter, even at a few months old. but one among dozens. Improbably, Rick has found a nursery, and each little billfish offers a fragile promise to the future.
They say the journey counts more than the destination, and certainly Rick's travels have yielded wonders. But like the old man in the sea, he's still after the big fish, a live grander, to share with all of us. There's still one more place to look. Halfway round the globe, off Australia's sparsely settled Cape York Peninsula, in the wildest part of the Great Barrier Reef. The key wind stirs up these tropical waters and keeps them cool. Good for fish, but tough on filmmakers. Turbulent seas make shaky pictures, and they're dangerous for swimmers. It's too easy to get separated from the boat. Time is ticking on Rick. If he's to find his giant marlin this year, he'll need to enlist the aid of the best big game fish captain in these parts, Tim Dean. What about this wind? It's been with us now for three weeks. Wow. Late season wind, it's, it's unseasonal for us, but it protects the fish. That's, That's part the of the deal here. You know, yeah. it's, it's rough weather, it's, it's hard. Nothing easy about chasing thousand pound black marlin. That's why I brought the biggest camera I could find. <laughs> You're gonna need it. Okay. A big lens. <laughs> How's your season been, Tim? And still the wind blows, as much as 40 miles an hour. Captain Dean promises it'll be well worth the wait to see one of his granders feed. The big blacks, they eat just about anything that swims past them. Rick, these, these fish are the... When, when they're coming into your, your pattern of baits or lures and you watch these things actively feed, it's, it's frightening. You know, a lot of people say if they roared, you wouldn't catch them. You'd be too scared. And then, finally, the weather breaks. It's Rick's last opening to get offshore. He heads east with Dean to the Ribbon Reefs. Lying about 30 miles off the coast, they form a narrow but treacherous ridge along the edge of the continental shelf. There, Tim feels confident he'll find Martin. The crew cut up large bonito and mackerel as bait. They don't use hooks. They're not trying to catch her, just bring her close to the boat. Preparation is critical because when the moment comes, it comes quickly, and it won't last long. Tim tells Rick he'll be lucky to get 30 seconds in the water with his marlin. From his vantage point on the flying bridge, Tim scans the surrounding waters looking for shadows. Any dark shape could be a big game fish, but it could also be a shark. Mistaking one for the other could prove fatal for Rick. There he is, Dave, on you. Wind it up. Get ready there, Rick. Get right ready. Nice big fish. Clear yours, Andy. Clear yours. Get ready with that camera. Hold it there, Dave. Hold it there. Okay, there he is. Wind it up. Wind it up. Oh, it's a nice fish. There's three fish there. Go, Rick. Go. Go. You're in. You're in. Camera. Wind it up there. Wind it up. Oh, nice work. He's right there amongst them. The big fish is on me so fast, I just have enough time to switch on the camera. All I can think about is, don't blow it, get the shot. The marlin is enormous. I'm fighting a strong current pushing this heavy camera, and a fish moves so quickly, with just a flick of her tail, she's out of sight. She is aware of everything around her, including the stranger in her realm. She comes back repeatedly to check Rick out. What does the fish make of a man? Just when I'm finally keeping up with her, I realize I've come upon a mating scene. There are a couple little males, maybe a quarter of her size, in there too. Flushing bright blue with excitement, they look for their chance to fertilize some of her millions of eggs. She's not just a big fish, she's the bearer of the next generation. For an extraordinary 20 minutes, Rick swims with the great fish, 
like the one that Hemingway hunted and never caught. She's a victory for Rick and a victory for the ocean. I'm wondering what she's seeing. Is she looking in that dome of my underwater housing? Does she see her own reflection? Or does it look like one big eye? I have this feeling that she's looking me over and that I'm something different in her world. But she doesn't appear to be frightened. This big Marvin seems so confident, and why wouldn't she be? She's in command of the situation. It's all up to her. She's letting me into her world. The entire time I was filming that big Marlin, there were three bull sharks circling below. And if you're gonna go in the water off Australia on the Great Barrier Reef and film Marlin, you better be prepared for sharks. They've been known to devour an exhausted marlin in 17 seconds. Rick has twisted luck long enough. Pounds, all lit up there. You're right in the centre of them all. It was, it was great to watch. Spectacular. In all my years, I've never seen a big fish just follow us along like that for such a long time. You kept coming back, leaving, coming in, eating a bait. Three bull sharks just underneath there, looking at the scene. Nice work, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an amazing encounter to be there with her enemies and her suitors, watching her feed. This is her reality. It makes me believe that the ocean's heart is still beating if we just give it a chance. Across three oceans and for more than two years, Rick Rosenthal has ventured where few of us will ever go. At last, through his eyes, we too can know the power and the plight of sword-wielding giants.